Can everyone please take their seat? Alright, so I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Arthur Hansen. Now, when I was reading through, his, uh, through the accomplishments of Dr. Hansen, I have to admit that I was a little intimidated. One of the first questions that came to my mind was, what was he doing at my age? Well, the answer is, selling 75,000 pins with a slogan on them that he came up with, give Earth a chance. Dr. Arthur Hansen is an officer of the Order of Canada and distinguished fellow with the International Institute for Sustainable Development following his term as president and CEO from 1991 to 98. He has worked with a number of organizations around the world, providing initial guidance, conducting research, and advising on innovation for sustainable development, environment, and economy relationships, biodiversity, oceans, and international development. Dr. Hansen has a strong interest in linking science to public policy and works closely with government bodies in Canada, the United States, and Asia on, spe on specific problems related to environmental management and mechanisms of accountability and governance for sustainable development. In recent years, much of his professional time has been spent working in with China. He initiated some of the largest environmental capacity building efforts currently underway in Indonesia, simultaneously working with the government, NGOs, universities, and the private sector. Much of this effort has involved establishing graduate degree programs such as environmental law and environmental studies. He served two terms on Canada's National Roundtable on the Environment and Economy and was Canada's Ministerial Ocean Ambassador with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for four years. Dr. Hansen served for 10 years as a member of the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and as a mentor in the Trudeau Foundation. He has provided advice to the Office of the Auditor General of Canada since 1990 and has chaired various national and international initiatives. From 1978 to 1991, he was professor and director of the School for Resource and Environmental Studies at Dalhousie University. Dr. Hansen holds a PhD from the University of Michigan in the field of fisheries ecology and natural resources and a master's degree in zoology or fisheries from the University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arthur Hansen. Thank you very much. And, and uh, when you were speaking earlier about uh, how much it should cost to come to the uh, lecture or whether you mortgage your house, I have known people that have mortgaged their houses right. house for uh, the oceans. Um, but I just want to tell you one little story about this teaching on the environment at the University of Michigan, which uh, the opening session of it was uh, had it attracted 18,000 people to uh, an auditorium and we had to turn people away. But we had a special secret deal with the president of the university because nobody got this place for free. And I was the fundraiser for all of this. And uh, uh, it, it was a big week-long event that I won't go into details on. But the funny thing about it was one night at home, I get this phone call from a guy who I didn't know at all. He introduced himself. And he said, you know, I think it is. He had read our prospectus, which had been published in some books and that. And, and he said, uh, I think it's outrageous that the university wants, you to wants to charge you $5,000 uh, for their one night's use. And I explained to him, well, the university said, nobody but nobody gets this for free. And uh, you're no exception. This, we, our group was called ENACT, Environmental Action Now. And so uh, we were prepared to raise the money. And he said, well, I really like what you're doing. I'm prepared to give you $5,000 to support it. But I want you to go to the university president and say, my name, and then say uh, he would give ten thousand dollars if the university agreed not to uh, to uh, uh, charge us five thousand for the uh, auditorium. <laughs> okay, so I phone up the head of the university development uh, fund, vice president for that, and and he immediately said, "Oh, he he phoned you? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, please come and see the president tomorrow." And so I go, and the president of the University of Michigan uh, was a labor uh, negotiator, 
um, and lawyer, I guess, a uh, very nice man, but uh, I walked into his office and I had this kind of sheepish grin on his face and I knew before he opened his mouth that we'd won. And it turned out this is one of the biggest benefactors to the university. And uh, in fact, his, uh, his family owned, uh, uh, his wife's family owned a newspaper chain uh, running out of Chicago. And apparently uh, her mother didn't want to give any money away. Her father wanted to give money away. So instead they gave it to the kids who gave it to good causes like the University of Michigan. And uh, so we got our money. But the funny thing about all those pins and that, and also the, uh, not this pin, but <laughs> those pins, uh, they, the uh, funny thing about that was that the um, university put a condition that we could charge no more than 50 cents admission to this event. event. So between selling the pins and the 50 cent admissions, I was the finances, finances uh, uh, chairman. So every day I would go around campus and we had this great network of people that were selling pins and selling tickets for the event. And, and I had a suitcase, which I think we still have around, a little silver suitcase. And it was a normal little suitcase. It wasn't too big because it was filled with coins. So every afternoon, I would try and casually walk across for fear of getting robbed because it was fairly close to a rough city, Detroit. And I'd be trying to be casual and my arm would be getting lower and lower and lower. So, but there was a lot, and I, I just gave uh, a talk last night at uh, Pearson College uh, on the West Coast to PhD students from Royal Road University and these very, very bright and competent young people that go into the baccalaureate program and have the privilege of attending Pearson College. And so I tried to give them uh, a talk on leaders, laggards, and the rest of us. And I've been thinking about that already and what you're saying, uh, uh, Jordan, because in the oceans area, we deal with leaders, and there's lots of them, and we deal with lots of laggards who see the world in very narrow sorts of ways. And uh, we also see the rest of us, who are the people in this room. It's you and me, because we can't all be experts in the oceans. And I'm not expert on all sorts of things. I go out for uh, frequent kayak rides and talks with a guy who's a, a, a physical oceanographer, one of the best in the field, who lives in Victoria. And, and uh, you know, he gets into discussions with me that I have no idea what he's talking about. And I try and, you know, like, what, you know, 200 foot waves and things like this, you know, that I just don't understand because it's all mathematical and it's all in his head. So, we're all learners, we're all people who want to do good, but we have to deal with some people who really have very strong vested interests as well and who would be happy to take the last fish out of the sea if they could put it into the money from that into their pocket. So, um, I'm going to, I, I thought first of all, I, I think we should give uh, Jordan an honorary uh, something uh, in ocean studies, not necessarily ocean sciences, but ocean studies is different, and we do need psychologists and people with human behavior understandings to bring the message out about the oceans. It's been one of the problems, scientists don't do a very good job, even though they're very good scientists. Uh, and some of them do, fortunately, and then there's people like Jacques Cousteau and so forth, many others like that, and organizations uh, that, that really try hard. Many of the big foundations, Conservation International, a whole range of ocean-oriented uh, bodies and so forth, but it's still not enough, and it won't be enough, I think, until people uh, who actually have a lot of interest in oceans, but, but still lack, feel they lack the means to do things about it. And, uh, and I would include uh, not the MPs in that. Our members of parliament tend not to understand the oceans. And some people say to me, they turn, people, some people in some places in Canada turn their backs on the oceans. They're more interested in agriculture and the things that happen on land. And, and that's a, a, a strong feeling that people have that uh, our parliamentarians uh, have not risen to the challenge, even though they've, uh, the government has signed those things. And one of the things that differentiates us from Australia is that the Australians generally, uh, they all live on the coast is one thing, surf on it, fish from it, do everything uh, near the water. And, and uh, they actually have the strong political will. There's politicians there uh, who have taken the oceans as a cause and who are very powerful uh, politicians. That's helped a lot, and I'll come to that later in the talk. But I want to start off, um, and I, I've got a lot to say. I'm going to try and say it as concisely as I can and watch the clock so we'll have some time for discussion. Um, and I want to start generally uh, looking at the global situation. 
And then I want to home in on Canada because we as Canadians sitting here and, and maybe some students who are not from uh, Canada here, uh, this is the country where you're trying to understand right now how we do things and that's very, very important. Uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from other countries, some of the Asian countries, good and bad we'll learn, uh, that I've worked with have some very interesting models for fisheries management. China, for example, they, say, they laugh at our fisheries models, let me tell you. They, and then the LOC, for example, and they say, we haven't got the money or the time to be able to <coughs> debate the finer points of the models that you have. What we do is we just stop all fishing during the spawning season for about two or three or four months, I forget exactly what it is, in the summertime. Oh, <laughs> and, and it isn't that they're doing it perfectly, but a lot of elements of that simple uh, mechanism work for them. Maybe sometimes we need simpler things rather than the very involved debate that goes on between the scientists, the fishery scientists who tend to be all concerned about fishing and population dynamics, people like myself that deal with ecosystems and think about food chains and think about habitat destruction and so forth, and, and then others who take yet another point of view, which is the uh, fisheries economist, who say get the price right, uh, individually transferable quotas and all sorts of exotica that I think are often useful, but there is no simple answer. So I'm going to be filling in the blanks here that uh, Jordan has left me plenty to fill in. Um, and, and I'm going to be focusing a lot on habitat, a lot on the ecosystem, because it's my belief that in addition to worrying about fishing, you have to worry about what's happening to where fish live, which is in the water, feeding on uh, things that, in that marvelous food chain that was described there. And, and uh, indeed, if we don't take that into account in our decision making about fisheries, then we only know about a quarter of what's really happening out there. So I, I just want to remind us, first of all, that uh, it's fair to say that our planet is about water and the water is salt water, 70% uh, of the, uh, the Earth's surface is covered by it. We depend on it. Every single person in this planet, whether or not they live in Afghanistan, whether they live in uh, British Columbia, Canada, or Indonesia, or any of the other places, um, we depend on uh, a variety of ecological services from the oceans. I won't go into that right now, uh, but it's very important to recognize that. Secondly, it is a history book of the earth. We look at the sediments, we know, understand where we get our oxygen from and so forth. And it's complex, but we can understand that. And we also depend on that as we look for the resources we exploit. Where do we find out about uh, how anchovies go up and down uh, because of El Nino and La Nina from the ocean sediments? We look for the scales of the, sometimes there's anchovies there, sometimes they're not there. Um, and in our use, uh, sediments and so forth, well, all that oil we use is basically from uh, phytoplankton from the sea and other sea creatures. It, so, um, we have to do understand that. It's the basis of natural wealth and of our prosperity. Half the people on the planet live close to the ocean, and that is always going to be the case. Um, their prosperity through trade, through fishing, through all sorts of different things, uh, we know about it. So the oceans governs trade settlement uh, patterns, and it, we now know and understand rather clearly it also governs climate and therefore climate change. But it's also the source of conflict, calamity, and crises. And I don't like to talk about crises, but I have to. Uh, and particularly in this talk, uh, people say the ocean is in crisis. Uh, and I think it's true, uh, frankly, despite all what uh, was said at the beginning of your talk, Jordan, and, and I would like to think that uh, um, uh, things are nice out there on the environment. Globally, they're in a downhill um, uh, turn for sure. But there's a way of looking at crisis that I think is very important. And I, again, I go back to some of the experience because I spend a lot of time in China. Uh, China doesn't like to talk about barriers, about not being able to do things and so forth. What they caution me and say, look, talk about crisis, yes, if you wish. We understand, we face crisis. For a long time we face crises. How do you turn crisis into opportunity? And that's very important. Chinese do that all the time, crisis to opportunity. And they actually do it often. They're able to solve their crises and they're better off, open new opportunities. I talk about what I call C2S, crisis to sustainability. How do we turn these things into a sustainable development pattern? Not easy, 
but not impossible. And particularly when I'm talking with an audience that includes people of the next generation who are going to have to solve all the messes and problems and uh, open the new opportunities that come with new technologies, etc. Um, I don't want to leave you with a message of failure and a message of uh, impossibility. It has to be a message of opportunity, and a message of hope, and so forth. And I think we can apply that to the ocean. So some of the examples that I'm going to present are things that seem to be going better now than they were, say, 10 years or 20 years ago. So please keep that in mind. If it gets too gruesome, just remember, uh, I'm basically an optimist and want to see hope for the future and hope that the people who carry the burden forward and the institutions that I hope uh, Finn can become as one of those can make real contributions to that. I'm looking at you Finn-like <laughs> person over there and some of the others that I met earlier this afternoon. Um, I, I really am honored that I can be here to kick off what I hope will be a successful effort on the part, not just of U of T students, but of uh, students across the country, because we need, we need this kind of support and understanding and real action that can come out of uh, the vigor of people who carry challenges forward into the next generation. The reason I was speaking in Pearson and happy to do so, Pearson College, is that I'm going further and further down the food chain. Um, I feel that uh, we have to be working in a very intelligent way and communicating with people that are still in high schools, junior high schools, and elementary schools, so that they come into the, the university world with an attitude of responsibility to the, some extent, but understanding particularly of things where they can make a difference in the years ahead. So those are some preliminary points. Okay, so now we get into the nasty stuff. Ocean health and decline. You're going to hear these things. And, and there's a new index. And I've given, uh, there's a lot of words in some of these slides. Don't even try and read them all. Listen to me. But I'm just, <laughs> we're trying to uh, take um, a, a videotape of this. And we're going to intersperse some of the slides. So I want a little bit more detail. That's why I put it in here. And also uh, ways that you can find this information easily. <coughs> So there's this new thing that uh, people have been trying for some time to get an integrated uh, overview of ocean health. And you can see it's not very good. Overall in the world, 60 out of 100. And if you go on the website, you can find what each country, uh, uh, where it's good and not good. Interestingly, Canada gets 70 out of 100. So um, uh, maybe we can uh, trumpet uh, success in some areas. but. I would say that uh, certainly I don't see things in great shape right now in Canada in the same way that Jordan uh, uh, announced as well. And so let's, let's talk about health for just a second. Two quick examples. Beautiful place, uh, Broughton Archipelago. Uh, Broughton Archipelago is where uh, Alexandra Morton and others uh, feel that uh, the caged salmon that are aquacultured there are carrying an excessive parasite load that the wild salmon coming down, the pink salmon, from very remote rivers uh, on the BC coast uh, are picking up the parasite load and dying off. This is a big tussle between science and citizen science. Um, and and uh, I must say, it's not a resolved issue. I'm kind of on Alexander Morton's side, I think, on this. But in general, the health of the oceans, the health of ecosystems, and what it means to us uh, brings it back right into economic terms. Now, this is another big puzzle. Uh, this man who I spent a day with uh, several years ago took this picture is Dr. Peter Ross, who's just lost his job because the whole group of people in toxicology that deal with ocean toxicological issues, paid for often by people from other countries like the United States, or, uh, and give us uh, data that's absolutely essential um, from monitoring different uh, Animal, mainly seals, but up and down the coast. You can see where pollutants are coming across from Asia because they hit the northern stocks. You can find out the effects of drugs uh, and diseases that come out in our sewage from cities like Vancouver. And, and then if you go down towards uh, the southern part of what's now called the Salish Sea, Puget Sound, where they've been building naval ships, and you can find all the heavy metal issues and so forth. See, so, you know, I get a feeling for things. So there was a network that he was involved with um, and they've all lost their job. We don't seem to want that information anymore. 
So uh, are we getting the right kind of information on the health of the oceans? And I would submit if, if we don't have people like Peter Ross, um, then it's uh, quite uh, uh, difficult to get that information. I should also add, it's hilarious working with him. He goes out wearing a hockey helmet because uh, there's two ways that you get the uh, seals. You don't really want to be the seal. The seal's going to live, but it's going to have a few scars after he's been visited, or she, from uh, uh, Peter Ross. So the, the one way he likes to do it is you quietly go up in your boat and you uh, put on your hockey helmet, and then you run like hell into the water and uh, onto the shore and grab the seal. They have to be of a certain size, so they're standardized. Uh, if you're lucky, you don't bash your head on the rocks, it's, it's slippery rocks with lots of algae. The other way, which he doesn't want to do but also works, is that uh, the seals go in the water and, and then you, uh, he's got a, a thin nylon net out, set out, and the seals go into the net, they're startled, and, and he tries to get the uh, one or two seals and make sure that no others are in there. You get about five minutes before the seals start struggling and maybe would drown. So, but he's a very, very good scientist and it pains me greatly. He'll do fine. Whether uh, that network can continue its work uh, properly um, is beyond me. I don't see how it can. Health is also about people and communities. Um, if you live on the West Coast or on the East Coast, this is a prime thing, that people feel the loss. They feel the loss of livelihood, the loss of integrity of work that they felt important over the years as fishermen or uh, various other ocean-related uh, uh, activities. And whether it's in Prince Rupert uh, in northern British Columbia or whether it's uh, in communities in the south shore of uh, Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, um, this is a very serious issue. And it's one that we don't seem to do as good a job in Canada as places like Norway uh, and maybe Australia in, in handling. Um, and we can come back to that point. Uh, new, li new livelihoods emerged. Lunenburg, um, a school, sailing school with a beautiful schooner. Um, sea kayaking, a summer thing. Whale watching. Um, and interestingly, if you're into music, folk festivals. Uh, and the, the folk festival part of it is held right on the, uh, on the seashore. And boats come and go like this beautiful big one in the background in the lower picture. But there's also calamity in the oceans. And calamity takes many forms. Um, the cyclone Nargis, for example, um, in, in Burma, where over almost 140,000 people were killed by a terrible. Maldives, uh, the prime spokes country for climate change, the Maldives basically uh, disappear uh, with sea level rise in a given amount of time. And, and then there's the insidious kinds of things like ocean acidification. And I'm, I won't go through this uh, slide, but just to say that uh, oceans and climate change are intimately related, but don't get nearly as much attention as the atmospheric uh, side of things. I happen to think that uh, on both the mitigation side and just the general scientific uh, knowledge base, that the oceans are basically still largely ignored compared to their significance. Then we go on to things, and this is an area that I'm very familiar with, and this brings me to tears sometimes. Uh, there's an area of the world called the Coral Triangle. Indonesia, uh, Philippines, parts of Malaysia, and parts of uh, Papua New Guinea area. And, and this is the leading center for ocean biodiversity in the world. It's the thing that drove me first to live in Indonesia, was the fact that I was working in the Caribbean on something for my master's thesis, and I realized that for every species of this little crab that I was looking at, there was six or seven species in the Coral Triangle area. If you go to that area, the reefs are being destroyed at an incredible rate. Partly it's stupidity, it's greed, it's market demand for certain things. I could go on. Fish are poisoned, so you can get maybe a tenth of them for aquarium fish, saltwater aquarium fish. That's coming under control a bit. People go off and risk their lives uh, to have in the last uh, decades, risk their lives to go into old munitions dump, uh, dumps in uh, uh, West Papua and Papua New Guinea to, to uh, take the explosives, to take them out of the shells and then go back and blow up reefs with them. And I've seen these reefs, in some cases small islands, for example in South Sulawesi, where 
where the, the very lives of people depend on the integrity of the reef because they protect the small islands uh, around where people live. And still, people will come in from outside and blow up the reefs just to get the fish, stun the fish, take the fish, goodbye, go to another reef. And the damage that's wreaked in that process is, is quite incredible. I'll come back to the Coral Triangle because the countries now recognize that, that it's urgent, that it's a crisis situation, and they're trying their best to do a number of things. One of the, one of the important points is that they talk about a blue carbon budget. In other words, the reefs, if they're properly managed in that, will extract a great deal of uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, as a consequence of the reef being there and more or less do it permanently. So th there's always good news and there's lots of bad news. West Africa, uh, the fishing, uh, the, the term which I don't really like, but it's uh, illegal, um, unreported, and it's unsustainable as well, uh, but uh, fishing, um, and this is one of the prime areas that is um, um, bringing people in from the surrounding countries and taking fish caught, uh, taking fish illegally, and then these fish will be transported off. This is a Korean vessel. On the bottom, uh, so it'll be transported to Korea, possibly through Europe, uh, and, and some sold in the EU as well. On the bottom, uh, it's a, a mothership with uh, illegal trawlers that are out there. And there's now spotting mechanisms where local populations, because as, as was already said, people now have access to equipment like this, waterproof cameras and this, that and the other, access to the internet to know exactly which ship it is that's uh, fishing and people that go out in their canoes and take pictures and then report that. So th this is one of the interesting things that technology can be very helpful in this process. And then finally, I'm going to talk quite a bit this evening about the Arctic, changing environment and development pressures. These are some photos. I wish I had been in a nice position to be able to take these. They're taken by Department of Fisheries and Ocean staff. But narwhals and um, belugas coming up uh, in the little areas that are open in the Arctic. Well, we know there's going to be lots more areas open in the future, but we don't know what the fate of these animals will be. Now, uh, I did this diagram to try and understand the overall governance of ocean use. Um, and I know a lot about that mainly because I've worked with some very interesting lawyers and others, uh, people involved with fisheries management and uh, ocean management. And don't worry about all the details. I, I, I did this diagram uh, about the year 2000. It hasn't really changed much, except that now there's uh, not just the 1992 Rio, but as was pointed out, we're up to 2012 Rio plus 20. Um, and the, the important point here is that um, whatever we do with the oceans now doesn't just involve Canada, doesn't just involve a province in Canada, it involves international management, uh, the use of global consensus documents like the law of the sea, it involves trade and investment, uh, activities of various sorts, and I'm going to talk about some of these. National and local interests, which are often very vested interests and not in the best interest of uh, the ocean, but sometimes they are and are not listened to. And the generation of knowledge, uh, which comes not just as knowledge from scientists, but it comes from people that have um, a flame in their belly, like uh, we heard in our last talk, and uh, people that are uh, in native communities, First Nations, community groups, uh, and many, uh, many other interests. So knowledge now is drawn from many places. How do we put that knowledge together? And so we have things like a very, uh, very, very good thing called the Global Ocean Forum. I don't have time to go into the, uh, I, but I suggest you take a look at it. And this has become kind of a pressure group at the international level. Um, and you can see, don't worry about all of them, but uh, there's a lot of different areas. And all of these areas relate back to the fundamentals of uh, aquatic resource management, fisheries. There's also a new, uh, yet another, I, I hasten to add, and I don't know what they're going to be able to do, a uh, Global Ocean Commission that's been established, launched just a few weeks ago, with a focus on the high seas, those areas of the deep blue that uh, uh, Jordan correctly pointed out are not necessarily all the productive areas, but they do play a major role still in our use of the oceans. And one of the big questions is, what, who should, how should high seas uh, marine protected areas be set up? And how should they be managed? Because all those neat things like bluefin tuna that go in a big circle around from the Gulf of Mexico 
up to the east coast of Canada, across to West Africa, and then across to here. And they face a gauntlet of uh, fisheries boats, uh, a tremendous number. Each of those fish is worth $50,000. One or two of those fish means the difference for a Canadian fisherman between a good year and a bad year. Uh, and so the incentive to keep fit, to have sustainability of the harvest, but there's also Japanese in the high seas, and there's people in the Mediterranean side, et cetera, and there's a lot of, some illegal fishing. So anyways, Paul Martin's a Canadian member of this, and I wish him luck. But we frankly have had lots of very good advice from global ocean commissions, and we haven't seen the uptake of that advice nearly as strongly as we should. And that's a troubling uh, matter. So I've entitled the uh, talk, uh, Not Just for the Taking. And, and I really mean that. The oceans are not just there for us to take. We have to give. We have to give a lot. We have to give our best to make the uses of the ocean sustainable. We have to understand that other creatures on this planet have a strong uh, rationale for being included in the list of voters of the ocean, the people, the creatures that have some take on that uh, uh, massive set of resources out there. So, but for us, we at least can talk back and forth as humans to each other, uh, and uh, we have to devise what I'd call a responsible care approach for Canada's oceans. And so I'm going to go through some of the, what I consider the elements of that to be, including some of the things that directly relate to fisheries. First question, and this comes from uh, John Fraser, who I think a lot of, former Minister of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who lives in the West Coast. And he talks um, as a person who is totally and absolutely committed to the health and the well-being of the oceans, and says, who speaks for the oceans, and what are they doing about it? And I think that for your group, Finn, you should ask that question. You should be one of the groups that's speaking for the oceans. But what are you going to do about it? What is it that you can do to make a difference? And that question should be first and foremost in your mind. Here's a couple of Canadian authors to add to the very good list. Uh, and that was a short list, uh, by the way, that uh, Jordan uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, there's lots of others. But the book Seasick, uh, written by Alana Mitchell, former uh, Global and Mail writer, she put a couple of years of her life into writing this book. And it's very, very good. It's been highly acclaimed, in fact, uh, and it's based on science, but she's not a scientist, be the first to say that. She's a journalist trying to explain things about the oceans. And you can see from her title what her um, conclusion is. Uh, Farley Mowat, uh, who's often a controversial figure, but his book, Sea of Slaughter, will go into more detail about the things that Jordan was talking about, about this unending slaughter of creatures from the ocean over the last 500 years in Canada. Um, I once uh, showed a film about Sea of Slaughter at Dalhousie University, and the graduate students that, uh, asked me to stop it in the middle. They said, we can't take any more. If this is what the situation is, why are you spending your time on this? Why don't you just give up and try and do something simpler? Well, that's not the way I'm constructed, I guess. <laughs> but, but the point is, uh, it's not pleasant reading, but it's a reality check about what we have done in the past. And I'd also like to pay tribute to some people who, um, you know, Canada as a nation has produced some of the best fisheries and ocean scientists in the world. At one point in time, we were probably, with, along with a few uh, European countries, um, having the best scientific journals and so forth and paying the most attention in terms of uh, free access to information and, and good research uh, codes of ethics and funding in, in the ocean sciences. And, and uh, I've only put three names up here of people who are involved as, in ocean studies or ocean science, uh, people that have regrettably passed away. I, I, if they were still alive, and there's many, many of my colleagues that I could put up here, I'd be hard pressed to choose which ones. But let me just give you this very brief profile of these people. Ran, Ran Myers, Ransom Myers, worked for the government and left the government, wanted to be more independent, became um, um, a leading um, uh, professor at Dalhousie University, and uh, got a great uh, following from the world's press because he told it like it was, using his accurate scientific approaches as best he could about the state of uh, fisheries in various parts of the world, and including uh, 
um, uh, those on the east coast of Canada. Elizabeth Mann Borghese, who uh, many people worship around the world, uh, she's the daughter of Thomas Mann, the great author, and a wonderful person who gave herself over completely to the oceans, also at Dalhousie University, but headed the International Oceans Institute and trained and got the money to train by hounding people like Pierre Trudeau and others in Canada saying, please give me money, and then using that money to get more money. And so thousands of people now have been trained in understanding the complexities of oceans because of her work. She was also a great author uh, on the oceans as well. And the third person who died recently and who I had the good fortune to work with was a psychologist, so not all is lost for you in this field. He sorted out how to um, reduce the damage from the interaction between fishermen and whales in, in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, that was his first claim to fame, many more things since then. But he learned how using basic behavioral things that involved both the behavior of the whales and the behavior of the fishermen, so that when whales got, which was very frequent, which when whales got caught in the fishermen's traps, the cod traps, um, the, um, and these are big whales, really big whales, and, and everybody got upset. The whales got upset and often died. Fishermen put themselves in danger but lost a great deal of money, and who wants to kill a whale? So anyways, he worked that out and had teams that could actually go out and do it. So, uh, but he did many more things. Um, and, and these are people who made a substantial contribution in their lifetimes and serve as an inspiration for me and for many others. Um, getting down, and again, I'm just uh, suggesting maybe if you're serious about uh, wanting to understand what we should be asking as research questions, Here's what uh, some of the leading ocean scientists in Canada um, are talking about. And they, they, bring a, they bring in these four areas. Yes, bring, improve the fundamental scientific understanding, but we've got to have the information about monitoring and how you use that information. And you have to look at really understanding the impacts of human activities. And then you've got to bring this information back into governance and management. So it isn't just about managing a specific fish stock. We've gone beyond that now, because when you try and do it, we find often it's almost impossible, because there's big questions that, that are ignored in that approach. Um, this is a rather interesting uh, new uh, uh, document that's just come out, but it gets to the, what I'm going to try and say in uh, some of the things tonight. Then there's other people that, so there's, there's the scientific community speaks for the issue. Then there's all these folks, um, uh, CPAWS, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, the Vancouver Aquarium is a great place, uh, Ecology Action Center in Nova Scotia, the Living Ocean Society in the West Coast, WWF, they have major programs that relate back to this. And, and I would really, really uh, strongly underline First Nations and all three coasts of Canada, four coasts if we include the uh, Maritimes, uh, we include the Great Lakes. Uh, they have an incredibly important role because they have constitutional rights uh, that relate back to the oceans. So we have this opportunity. We've got the longest coastline in the world. Uh, and our maritime estate, people don't often recognize, is about, uh, depending on how you count it, uh, but it could be as high as 70% of the land area. So that's, that's an important figure to remember. And then we have this uh, uh, purple exclusive economic zone, which from 1977 onwards has been the opportunity side for Canada. It's been perceived is if we only had our hands on the management of that, and now we have had it for uh, since 1977, we could do much better, get much more value from our use of the ocean. Uh, we could make it much more sustainable. Reality has sometimes been a little different. Now, uh, if you'll allow me a little bit of uh, uh, West Coast snobbiness, um, from coast to coast to coast to coast. So we start in Vancouver, but the one I like here is just near my home in Oak Bay, uh, Victoria. Um, Boxing Day, and you think of Boxing Day sails. Well, the people in, in, uh, in uh, Oak Bay think of sailing in a different sort of way on Boxing Day. And there they are out in the water in their wetsuits and their boats with Mount Baker in the background. But here's another amazing thing. The Western Arctic, um, that ice highway goes 40 kilometers. It, it comes up from Inuvik. You travel all along the Mackenzie River. And then you go to the little hamlet of Tuktoyaktuk, which is important strategically for a number of reasons. 
And the last 40 kilometers, you're actually traveling on the Arctic Ocean, the frozen ocean. So they've just announced this week that uh, they are going to put in an all-season road, which will be $300 million. And of course, one of the reasons for that is simply that they won't be able to use ice highways up there much longer. It's becomes, the season becomes too short and tenuous. Um, and this is one of a uh, person I did a lot of mentoring with, uh, uh, Janelle Ke uh, Kennedy, uh, on the Eastern Arctic, uh, where of course this is uh, prime area for what's going to happen in the future with icebergs and so forth, uh, but also one of the most interesting areas uh, because we don't know very much about the continental shelf in that area. Some people say it's better known on the uh, say surface of the moon than it is uh, on the, along the bottom of that area. Um, people are already looking at it though for oil and gas exploitation, for shipping purposes, and they're also looking for um, uh, fisheries. Surprising how many things are happening in the Arctic right now where people want to go up and test fish. On the east coast it's for things like cod, on the west coast there's already salmon moving around into uh, all the uh, Pacific salmon are now found in, in some Arctic rivers. To the other coast, uh, Gander, and, uh, I was in a narrow, small airplane with uh, John Lean, the person, the uh, whale man. Gander and Fogo Island, uh, all covered in ice at that point. And then to a place where uh, I really enjoy being, which is Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, one of the great uh, shipping uh, wooden ship building and so forth uh, places and it happened to be there the day they were relaunching the Blue Nose 2, uh, almost newly built. And it's kind of interesting if you look along that shoreline, there's the Sea Shepherd. You would know the Sea Shepherd Paul Watson's boat, which has been impounded by Canada um, for, for uh, reasons that I won't explain right now. And then you can see these other large boats um, and you can see the Dartmouth Ferry and a small naval vessel in dry dock there as well. It, it really is an active little spot. But don't forget that the ocean's influence uh, extends to uh, Ontario, not only directly through the uh, uh, St. Lawrence region um, and particularly there for Quebec, but also the water comes out of Ontario, the quality of the water and so forth. Uh, Creatures from the ocean come up into the uh, Great Lakes, uh, including those alewives and uh, some other little things that are really nasty and cost us billions of dollars in management of uh, uh, these species. But uh, uh, it's also officially considered in Canada that these are inland seas that deserve to fall under the uh, purview of fisheries and oceans for some things. And then we think of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now, uh, it's a very interesting body of water there, but what I'd like you to look at is those little circles. And then I'm going to show you some more circles. Um, one of the th most interesting things for me of trying to simplify my understanding of very complex oceanography is to look at the things that go round and round and gyres and circles of one sort or another. The simple example is when you go sea kayaking and you're out there straining against the current and so forth, maybe the tide's against you and there's a strong current, maybe a wind blowing against you. So you go in shore and then you find a counter current and then you're just swept along because that counter current is going this way while the main current's going that way. So you get a free ride instead of uh, being out. In. So lots of other things get free rides. So if you look at what's called the Haida Eddy here, you see these little swirls out in the... Uh, going out into the ocean there. Well, they're driven by the fresh water, which is all that red stuff coming down from the rivers, like the Skeena River and some others. And, and uh, those swirls are, are driven by the current patterns of the ocean. And they go out and they transport all the larvae from the inshore and the nutrients out to the offshore. So you talked, uh, Jordan, about the, the seamounts. And one of these now, Bowie Seamount, is just out there, uh, up near the top end of it, uh, uh, that, that second set of swirls up there. And, and uh, um, that's how it gets all the fish that, that are out there that make it very special, and why it's a high productivity area. Another one is in the Beaufort Gyre, up in the Arctic, and that's a, a collection point for the whales uh, in the Arctic, and, and some of the uh, fish species as well, because of the high productivity. Same in the Gulf Stream. And here's a good example of how little we understand. For a long time, the oceanographers didn't understand that there were these gyres 
in, in that area of the uh, uh, Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream is going off, coming up the coast of the United States and heading off to Europe. Then there's all these countercurrents that are swirling around, just like the ones I'd be looking for on a kayak. And they're warm water. They're bringing warm water in off the ocean. So if these um, countercurrents happen to be in place just at the time that the scallops, which are down on uh, George's bank shelf, are spawning, then the little creatures coming up get swept away by the warm water because they're cold water creatures. And, and uh, you don't get a good spawn that year. So if you're going to try and understand the management of things, you have to understand phenomena like the, uh, the gyres and the eddies in the oceans. And, and this is uh, a, my first introduction here of things ecological, physical ecological phenomena that, that won't come out through an examination of studying fishing pressure because they're environmental in focus. And there's lots of those kinds of things in the oceans. So this has led to great tussle. You can't believe, it's just like among economists. They, you know, what is, what's the saying that if you get uh, three economists uh, uh, in the room, you'll get four opinions, you know, or something like that? And well, the same is true with uh, fisheries biologists. I've actually sat in the office of an ecological uh, ocean scientist in British Columbia. I just happened to be there. When he was, um, uh, this was after the cod disaster, and he had just published uh, an article uh, with some others in Science Magazine, very highly respected journal, saying that the fisheries management people basically didn't understand what they were doing, uh, which I agreed with him, by the way, and we were talking about that. The phone rings just at that moment from a fisheries scientist who I won't give the name of in Eastern Canada, but who worked for government, and who was threatening to sue him for defamation of character uh, because they had they were at odds. Uh, they were analyzing the same problem from entirely different points of view. And particularly when I lived in Nova Scotia, uh, I could give you endless stories of this. And, and they, they were, uh, in one case, there was a whole very large ecosystem group, and they were shut down. They were shut down by um, the higher-ups because they were producing data that were at odds with what the population dynamics people were producing. I'm giving a simplified version of things, but so the point is, um, and I used to say this to students when I was teaching uh, fisheries things in, uh, in uh, Nova Scotia, uh, don't trust the experts, you know, form your own opinions. The experts are often very wrong and they wear blinders just like everybody else in society. And one of the biggest ones is about fisheries management. Same could be said at times in the past for forest management, but fisheries management is inherently even more complex. At least trees stand in line and can be counted. Rarely is that the case with fish <laughs> um, because of water currents, among other things. So here's, here's just a little uh, a collection of books, uh, and I could triple that collection about these different points of view, and I won't go into details. Now, this is a sad story here. Um, this is in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and uh, how many have ever been to Lunenburg? How many have ever been to Nova Scotia? Great, great. Well, if you go down to Lunenburg, you'll see this very moving, very, very moving uh, um, uh, set of, uh, what would you call these? Obelisks, maybe, I guess? And, and they list <coughs> as much as possible the names of people who were killed at sea. In some cases, there might be, they don't have all the names because it would be 50 or 100 people were killed in 1927. And again, while we were living there, there was a terrible incident. But these are just people from Lunenburg area because this was the Grand Banks fisheries. And, um, and it's very moving to see it, but the point is uh, we remember a lot about our ocean past and we even tend to glorify it uh, or feel sad about it or whatever. But what have we actually learned? You know, and there's. It just uh, for a little window dressing there, it's a couple of postage stamps to remind us about the glorious past. And that's the um, uh, fellow on the right, uh, uh, Angus Walters, was a, ve a very famous captain of the fastest of the, uh, of the ships, the Blue Nose. Newfoundland, that's that abundant cod population. But the interesting thing is the man that told us early on uh, stuff that is still being quoted uh, is Harold Innes uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, who was an economist who dealt with uh, this idea of heartland and hinterland in, in Canada. And the fact is that we were hewers of wood, drawers of water, fur traders, but also uh, we dipped into the ocean. And uh, he wrote this, uh, what happens when you um, 
um, get a really truly abundant uh, resource like the cod fisheries. That's a, that's his book, written in 1940, very prescient. And basically, he's saying as a, uh, an abundant tradable resource uh, can fuel an economy, but it also traps you in many ways. And and that is what has happened in Canada. In a sense, we've we've relied on superabundant natural resources, not just fish, but but it allows us, I've thought a lot about this over the years, trying to understand why we behave towards the resources we do. Like for example with a cod, when we lived in Nova Scotia, you know, you go in and buy this fish that was awful uh, in the stores. You, you couldn't get good cod in the stores. And, and the reason it wasn't good was because it was mishandled. Right from the time it was, it wasn't iced, it wasn't bled so you'd have a nice open flesh. And uh, it, it was treated as if it was going off to the carouse uh, to be treated as salted cod, you know, low value commodity. Uh, some other people, Icelanders, Norwegians, and some others didn't do that. They treated the fish property, they got uh, very good value added, and they started respecting the resource base even more. So that's the uh, important thing uh, for uh, those with an economic bent to recognize, is that you can, one of the, one of the ways in which we can actually get more out of our resource get, is to add value to it, handle it carefully, respect each fish that we catch, uh, which gets again into why is it that we can go in and use trawlers and you know, take a small fraction of the fish. But anyways, a lot of the stuff goes back to Harold Innes. And now the other thing is, and I hear I differ a bit from what, uh, what uh, was said about the, the empty oceans. Yes, the oceans are empty because we've, we've knocked out a lot of the food chain, but th there still can be an abundance. And as you correctly pointed out, uh, Jordan, if you like eating uh, jellyfish, which uh, actually I do, they're actually... <laughs> <laughs> and I keep asking my Chinese colleagues, uh, well, why is it that you eat, uh, you know, chicken feet or certain other things? <laughs> we'll go into some of the certain other things. Well, it isn't for the taste particularly, it's for the crunch, the crunch value. <laughs> and, and jellyfish is one of those things, and the same with Indonesians and others. They like the crunch, and they're delicious. Now, they're dried in Newfoundland. Newfoundland couldn't believe it's good luck when they discovered that there were actually people in the world that wanted to eat uh, jellyfish. But uh, they, so they started drying them and exporting them into these little flat patties, you know. But, and and it, there's certain other things that I could mention as well. And squid, uh, of course, is one of them. And so what you find is uh, an ocean that gets um, very abundant in those creatures that can be low in the food chain, often in what we call detritus food chains, you know, the stuff that rains down into the water column. So, lots of fishermen are now happy to see no cod in Nova, in, uh, well, I don't know about Nova Scotia so much, but uh, certainly, whoops, everything shut off of me, I guess. Have you got it there still? Yeah, you have. Can I have some technical help up here? Like, I've got nothing on my screen, and I do like seeing the screen. Oh, it's okay. Okay, it's no, got to it's just in. Okay, and then how do I get it to go back here? Just uh, hit that one. Yeah, there. Yep. Okay, so so we now have very very valuable snow crab and northern shrimp, and basically the ecosystem has changed. Don't expect the cod to come back, unless something catastrophic happens to these guys, because these have replaced basically replaced the cod. We'll see cod for sure. We'll see some other ground fish, but we probably won't see them in the abundance because these guys are eating on the food chain now. So, but uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, that there's fewer cod. If you ask the fishermen, a lot of them that have made a lot of money off these new species will say, hey, we're making more money, we've got better boats, etc. The question is, and I've tried to look at this question with some people in the Auditor General's office uh, some years ago, and we concluded that there was no knowledge base to support the hypothesis that these actually were being sustainably harvested, the new ones. In other words, we might end up with the same problem. <coughs> but let's go back again to what, uh, another thing that was mentioned earlier, and that is electronic gear and so forth. Well, it's, it's not exactly new, but it, it's in this period from about 1970 on. Um, and this man got a, a, an honorary doctorate from, I think, the University of um, New Brunswick. Um, and this, oddly enough, was one of his boats, uh, uh, which I happened to see in the dry dock in Lunenburg. Um, and and uh, Captain Medford Matthews was a real innovator with gear. And he brought in, this wasn't the first trawler that came by any means into uh, the region, uh, but it's, it's kind of like the early brand of the, 
of the uh, trawlers that are of a modern type and well equipped with all the gear that can take a lot of fish, sonar uh, things and other equipment. Well, here's what they look like now. Uh, here's another one with a couple of kayakers for scale. And, and these things are essentially the bulldozers of the sea. They, they, they do so much damage to the bottom, uh, they rip things up, and I think eventually probably we'll see these things phased out for other types of gear. That's my hypothesis. Uh, but in the interim, uh, these are deadly machines for, from the point of view of what they can haul for fish. It doesn't mean that they can't be made to be useful contributors towards sustainability if they're held in check. But um, particularly when you get in these big f vessels and then you get uh, facilities on them or factory boats that can accompany them that can take an immense amount and stay at sea for long periods of time because they can devastate uh, a whole region of the ocean very quickly. Now, then we move to what happens to fish after it gets caught. Um, if you look at this um, plant at the top, National Seafoods uh, is the world's, one of the world's major uh, fishing companies uh, and one of the largest ones in Canada. This uh, plant located in Lunenburg was the world's largest fish plant in the 1980s. Now, my daughter Laura will quite well remember when we used to go down to the uh, cottage, uh, some days we were downwind of this, uh, this, boat, uh, this uh, uh, plant and it was just a bad smell. They were taking all the remains and make, cooking it to make it into fish meal and selling it. But what does National Seafood do now? Um, white fleshed fish such as cod, haddock, and, uh, pollock and a bunch of others are kind of what uh, some people in the banking business would call fungible i.e. they're all, you can exchange them interchangeably. Uh, they're white flesh, you can make them into fish and chips. You can even take something like tilapia, uh, which is a freshwater fish, and call it cod. And that happens sometimes <coughs> illegally, but it happens. So in today's market supply chain, because China has become the most efficient processor, they get all this fish going to China. And it goes through big ports like Rotterdam, where it gets all muddled up. It could come from West Africa, it could come from South America, whatever gets turned into uh, um, chunks of fish that are partially processed there. Then it comes back to companies like uh, the one in uh, Lunenburg, where people squirt some nice things on top of it, and maybe make it a little fancier, make it into a frozen dinner or something like that. Then it gets stamped, made in Canada, and then sent to the United States or consumed in Canada, or maybe in Europe even. Uh, so that's, that's a reality. So if you were listening to the radio in the last few weeks, there's been a release of a report that estimates that something like 30% of this fish is actually mislabeled uh, because once it gets to Rotterdam or wherever, you don't know whether it's a cod or what, whatever it happens to be. So market supply chains go through this complex thing and, and um, it makes it very difficult for us to know, A, whether we're really eating what we think is cod or whatever else it might be, B, whether it was caught sustainably uh, or even whether it went through some mishap in its, uh, in its uh, process uh, that lowered the quality of the fish. So th this has become a major, major problem uh, in, in uh, ocean management and in management of the seafood chains, the sort of thing that you're talking about if you want to be a good citizen and only eat sustainably produced fish. Fortunately, there are solutions. Um, but just to give you an, another example of this, uh, and this is an area uh, where Australia was furious with us. See these, this large fish, the Patagonian toothfish, which some of you may have eaten as Chile. How many people, and I shouldn't ask the question, but if you want to raise your hand. Uh, have you ever eaten Chilean sea bass? Okay, well Chilean sea bass is one of those fancy names that's given for something that's actually a fish coming from Antarctica and for the most part unsustainably produced. And at one point in time, this has been cleaned up quite a bit now, but it was going from uh, Antarctica, uh, un, pretty much an unregulated fishery, uh, even though the Australians were really making a pitch for it. And, and then it would go to China, uh, it would be handled there, then it would come to Canada, and then it would be transshipped to the United States as Canadian fish. Australians weren't very happy about that, I can tell you. Uh, but, but again, this just illustrates things. So one of the ways to get around this is through all these various uh, choices that you can make. 
and people that help you to make good choices. It started with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and now the Vancouver Aquarium is in there, Seafood Watch. Uh, the most critical thing is something started by WWF and some others in the private sector uh, on the, what's called the Marine Stewardship Council, which is now certifying some, some species of fish. And uh, interestingly, many chefs now in the world will refuse, even in countries in places like Hong Kong and some of the big hotels, they will refuse to handle fish that are not certified. And this is a real step forward. And I could tell you some interesting stories, but I better move on. So uh, just go to fishchoice.com and take a look at uh, some of the things that are on there, or any of these individual websites. This is the future. This is a future that responsible seafood companies uh, like National Sea see as what they would be faced with always. And, and countries like China are now starting to recognize that they will have to uh, become involved. Then there's some of the really nasty things like uh, shark's fin. I took this picture in a Chinese restaurant, but the interesting thing there is um, Yao Ming, the guy who's so, so tall that he reaches to the sky, a uh, basketball player from China, respected, highly respected within China, and a person who doesn't just play basketball, but he's very interested in public uh, policy issues, and, and he came out and said, I will not have um, my wife-to-be and I will not have um, shark fin soup uh, served as is traditionally done at Chinese weddings. And I'm going to encourage all my fellow basketball players and sports figures and so forth to do the same. He's probably had more impact than any other single thing of uh, the scientists and others who wring their hands. Because China is the primary place now for shark fin soup and where all those 70 million or more shark fins are going. Now, little known facts. <laughs> I think they're facts. Uh, but it's always interested me in Nova Scotia that there's been a sword fishery. And if you go back far enough, there was, uh, there was all sorts of books written by people, I think Zane Grey type of books. Um, very rich people used to go to Nova Scotia and, and catch them off uh, as, as a sport fishery. But in the 1940s still even, uh, there was a, um, a harpoon sword fishery in Glace Bay up in um, Cape Breton Island. Hundreds and hundreds of boats. This is just one picture from the, um, from the um, era. And they had these canoes that they went out in, and men would go out there with harpoon waiting to catch a 400 or more pound swordfish. The interesting point about it is it still exists. And one of the points right now is that the Marine Stewardship Council has been asked to certify harpoon fisheries in the United States and in Canada um, and then also the pelagic longline. Now, you got introduced to the longline, and, and some people wrap their hands, to, put their hands to their heart and say the longline is the way to go because it's not involving those trawlers. But what the longline does is catches turtles, sharks, and all sorts of other things that are not the wanted species um, at the same time as they're catching swordfish. Uh, but uh, controversially, uh, the Marine Stewardship Council has awarded the Northwest Atlantic Canadian sword fishery, which amounts to about $10 million a year, um, um, certification that they were doing it properly. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't know on this one. But the interesting thing is they had already awarded the uh, spear fishery for the, sorry, the, yes, the spear fishery for the sword fishery. Uh, they're still using spears out there. And if you go, if you Google something along those lines. You can actually see little things for sportsmen in the United States, for example, going out on boats and throwing their, their harpoons at uh, getting swordfish. But you can see what happens in the, that uh, the government in the late 90s really put a clamp on things because you can see the decline on the, on the uh, swordfish going down there and went below what is considered a maximum sustainable yield of biomass. And, and you can see as a consequence of stopping that fishery, how it's built up to the point now where they feel that they can reinstitute a limited uh, sword fishery. So these are the sorts of things. This is, this is an oddball little example. It's not one of the great fisheries, but there's dozens, even hundreds, of these other kinds of fisheries out there that don't get the same kind of press as the cod fishery. Uh, the big ones, uh, the biggest single thing we have going for us now is the lobster, and then haddock uh, is a ground fish that is still uh, retaining some place in the in the uh, scale of things. A very nice fish to eat, but these are the things that sustain the small communities in the south shore of Nova Scotia, 
Bay of Fundy and so forth. But the point here is that the haddock went down and it went down maybe because of overfishing, but it wasn't on the scale of overfishing of the, uh, of the uh, cod. And almost certainly water temperature has played a role in it. So again, what's cause and effect between fishing pressure and uh, fish abundance? Sometimes not very clear. Here's another one. This just, uh, a friend of mine took this picture last weekend or weekend before. One day fishery, and you get all these collections of boats going out, and, and they kill immensely. Uh, they take huge schools of herring, and then the gulls and other birds are there, eagles, etc. And the, the point here, though, is that the abundance of herring is at the greatest level in the last 30 to 40 years. Responsible fishery scientists would say, we have no idea why. They may claim credit, too, and say, oh, it's because of our careful management. But it's been up and down and up and down. There's, I don't have time. There's an awful lot of interesting stories about this fishery and about the way the native people, the First Nations along the coast, perceive how it should be managed, where they wouldn't have any of these boats out there. They would be, because it's mainly managed for a herring roe, you know, the eggs. And, and uh, they go to Japan and places like that. But um, um, they would manage by lifting the things out on, off kelp where they've been spawned by the fish themselves and get rid of the boats, period. So there's differing points of view of what you can do. And some of those things, I think, are going to be the things for the future. Salmon. Uh, I have spent a lot of my life looking at, reading about, trying to understand salmon. I'll be the first to say it's really difficult. Not the only person uh, to say that. Um, there's aboriginal interests, which are strongly constitutionally supported. Commercial interests, which often are on the decline. Sports fisheries interests, which claim to produce about five to 16 times the value per fish landed, uh, because fishermen spend a lot of money. Uh, and then there's aquaculture. And anybody, anybody here from BC? Great. Well, you know that this is not exactly an easy subject in British Columbia. I mean, everybody has an opinion on it, and, and uh, it's really difficult. But look at this. This is a plot uh, several years ago of um, watersheds in Canada, because you have to involve the fresh water. Watersheds in, in British Columbia, I should say, were sockeye salmons in decline, so the yellow and red watersheds. Huge number of watersheds under threat. That's likely to uh, increase uh, because of global warming, and the streams are warming up, and other things happening in the watersheds, the pine bark beetle killing all the trees, trees go, uh, water runs off, isn't there for the spawning season. So the salmon's truly in trouble, uh, no matter what. Aquaculture, uh, if you look at a, a net like this, this is a fairly well-run uh, aquaculture uh, setting in uh, Quetzino Sound. Each of those netted areas holds about 50,000 fish this size. And if you've ever seen anything like that close up, it's quite amazing. So this is just fish packed uh, in place. The fish aren't discontented, um, and um, uh, there's varying points of view about it. But uh, some of you may know that uh, uh, our Prime Minister appointed uh, uh, a justice from British Columbia, it was called the Cohen Commission, uh, to look at the future of the Fraser River salmon, the biggest uh, run. And, and uh, don't read all of this, but the basic point is that uh, Cohen said, if, if people were expecting that I'd find a smoking gun, one causality to it, no, no way. And, and I think, I certainly felt that would be what he would come up with at the end, that there's all sorts of factors. But read what he says, Fraser River sockeye face an uncertain future, shrinking resources, um, which may result in delays in implementing reforms and research, shrinking, shrinking resources being uh, less money around, DFO has been cut badly, um, meaning that the stressors to which sockeye are exposed will continue, and the deterioration of sockeye habitat will get worse. The waters constituting Fraser River sockeye habitat are warming. And then pointing out uh, that basically, uh, because the government had taken a bunch of amendments before receiving his, uh, uh, to the Fisheries Act, that uh, in fact the future of management of the Fraser River is, is unknown, and that's putting it in the most positive terms. And, and so um, th these are guarded comments. The whole report, the summary of that, if you want to get a sense of that particular very important resource and why it's difficult to manage, read that report. So. My, my uh, concern, see we have these various things that we can do in Canada for the oceans. And two big things, one is the Fisheries Act, 
which is in, a, is in a very old, one of the first uh, pieces of legislation we had in Canada, and I won't give you a boring and dull description of all the parts of it, but it sets the basis for conservation of fish, for pollution control, and a number of other things related to habitat, etc. And also sovereignty over our resource and sovereignty between the federal government and uh, provincial governments in, in its management. Uh, it's a very important piece of legislation. It's been changed uh, quite dramatically in the last year, uh, placing less emphasis on the uh, habitat aspect in particular. Uh, but we also have the Oceans Act in Canada. And this was a new piece of legislation that came out in the 1990s and, and essentially set a new basis of um, management around ecosystems, sustainable development, in other words, balancing between the various kinds of uses of the ocean, and specified the need for uh, attention to ma marine protected areas, and also <coughs> uh, what was called, uh, eventually became called LOMAS, large ocean management areas, that take big chunks of the ocean and try and develop uh, uh, plans for them. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of a few of these, and you can, uh, th this talk will be available to anybody that wants it, and you can uh, see in more detail. But, but the LOMAs uh, represent uh, a move towards the ecosystem-based approach, and, and one that's based on consultation among the various users, whether they're First Nations, whether they're oil and gas, fisheries, and so forth. It's building relationships and dialogue among the various users. And the idea is to plan for surprises, plan for management strategies that you could actually implement, and get that information in advance of development. So uh, one that I'm very familiar with is ESM, East Coast uh, uh, Scotian Shelf, and they produce good work um, and so forth. I won't talk about it anymore. One that's citizen-led, uh, scientist-led, and led by both Canada and the United States is the area of the Gulf of Maine, particularly. George's Bank is part of that, and then up into the Bay of Fundy. And here, the federal government has a limited has taken a limited role, um, and it's been the states and the provinces working together that's really done some very innovative work. Won't have time to go into it, but I wanted to say just one thing. If you this is the boundary line between the two countries, uh, painfully worked out, and I could tell you interesting stories about that because I was had some role in some of that. It was very interesting. But uh, if you look up towards the Bay of Fundy and into New towards New Brunswick, which is um, just to the right of the top of the line, of the top line. Um, Whales and ships collide up there because that's where it's a natural, one of these areas with lots of currents flowing and gyres and so forth, and, and it's incredibly productive. The whales come up there to feed in the summer. Some of the scarcest whales, humpbacks are there, but some of the other whales, and, and they collide with the ships. So you get these ships going up into, uh, uh, particularly for an oil refinery located up there, and they find a, a whale draped over this. They have a kind of a bulbous front on them, and there's a whale, a dead whale there. And, and so the right whales particularly, um, there's only about 300 of them left, I think, and they were being knocked off right and left, uh, no pun intended, uh, in that area. So there was a simple solution. It was a very simple solution, and one that's worked remarkably well. They just changed the shipping lanes slightly, and they put in place a kind of a spotting mechanism, because you can see the whales. And so people would know where the whales tended to be clustered on a given day, so there's some leeway in where the ships go. And problem, not completely solved, but let's say 80% solved. So this, there's, there really are win-win situations out there. And the charge for that was led by, you can see how Nova Scotia goes down to kind of a little point, not, not the big part of Nova Scotia, but there's a little kind of peninsula, a beautiful place. The, the school teacher was uh, living out there, and she took it upon herself to be part of the solution and organize local groups to actually spot and be able to say where the whales would be and demonstrated to the scientists who didn't really believe in this, I don't think, very strongly, that, that it could actually be a solution. So it started from a citizen. And I have a lot of respect for what I see as citizen science in the oceans uh, throughout this country. I could give you many other examples in the West Coast and in the Arctic and so forth. Another one that I think involves a heavy degree of citizen input is the Saint, Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, uh, Action Plan, which is being implemented primarily through uh, um, uh, Environment Canada. And here there's something called ZIP, and we don't need to go into the details of it, but ZIP committees exist throughout the Gulf, and, and around, particularly around uh, uh, 
Quebec. Uh, it's all this is all about Quebec. Um, and the the neat thing about it is that uh, it it brings the stakeholders together, and they come to real solutions about local problems that affect their part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And the government and others provide a broader input into overall what the St. Lawrence Action Plan would look like. So there's some degree of coherence throughout the whole region. Now these are good things that are happening. And they've, they, they've been developed by people working together, painstakingly working together, I might add, for more than a decade of interaction, overcoming all sorts of obstacles, <coughs> of differing points of view, narrow points of view, etc. So these are some of the good things that are happening in Canada. Uh, one that I helped to get underway in terms of uh, some of, I won't go into all sorts of stories about it for time reasons, but a uh, terrible name, PINSEMA, Pacific North Coast Integrated Management Area. And this includes uh, what I, I hate the word also world class, the phrase world class, but the oceans in this area are stunning in terms of the diversity of life uh, and also the intactness of the ecosystems. In this whole area, uh, in the northern part of Vancouver Island, um, up to Prince Rupert, there's only 15 or 20,000 people living in that whole area. And that's an area that's probably about as long as the coast of, much of the coast of Norway, for example. Um, and actually find intact ecosystems. You can fly at, lo at reasonably low levels and see gigantic sunfish floating on their side, you know, they weigh a thousand pounds or more. You can see whales, you can see, if you're in a boat, where the seabirds go, and then there's important uh, uh, fisheries activities in that as well. There's a wonderful atlas of it uh, if you want to look at it online and you can download that. But um, there's all sorts of other activities. Th this is uh, drawn from that atlas, just showing who's got uh, uh, oil and gas exploratory wells and tenures in the area. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of people have staked that territory. There's another one that shows uh, all sorts of different fisheries interests. Well, interspersed with those, I don't know if I've got the, no, I don't. Um, I took it out I've, for time reasons. Uh, if, I, if I could show you where the corals are and where there's the thing called uh, glass sponges, which we thought were uh, creatures that had gone extinct. They were studied as fossils in Germany. And that was where they found them, around uh, the uh, uh, areas, I think, that are fossilized now in Germany. And suddenly, about 15 years ago, somebody discovered that there was huge beds of these uh, things uh, around this area, that primarily the area is kind of a pale orange. Um, so, what are you going to do about it? These were areas that were just beginning to be used heavily by trawlers. The trawlers were starting to plow right through these ancient beds, because these, some of these are thousands of years old. Um, and and uh, a stop was put to it. Um, and now they're all plotted, we know where they are, there's exclusion zones for the corals, for the uh, uh, fisheries. And the same, uh, uh, around up till about 2000, there was an official almost denial that there was uh, these soft corals that were found on the east coast and the fishermen had been complaining about, it, particularly the longliners, that, that the trawlers were going through and bringing up these things. And I went to a, fisher, a fishery association museum in southwest Nova Scotia and they had all these big corals. And if you went on the west coast to, uh, to some of the, uh, com uh, not commercial, but um, sports fishing shops and boat uh, places, they'd have them on the wall, same thing on the west coast. Well, officially they didn't exist. And finally, they did exist. And now there's all sorts of exclusion areas for the red corals as well. So, progress, but it's slow and it's painful. The northern gateway, I'm not going to even touch tonight if you want to ask me questions about it, but, but this is the prime uh, example now of why we need something like PINSEMA to generate the kind of data that would be helpful to know how much, uh, what is the actual risk. Unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason, the uh, government has decided to more or less, not totally, but more or less um, gut the cooperation that had been established through PINSEMA and, and that mechanism uh, seems to be lost now. Another one in the north is the Beaufort Sea Partnership. Uh, which is a, a complicated thing, and you can see the vision of it is basically uh, ecosystem health and su supporting sustainable communities and economies for future generations as well as the present. The problem with the Beaufort Sea Partnership is uh, there's a lot of things that relate to land claims and, and uh, uh, northern um, local peoples up there that have made it very difficult, and I'm not blaming them, but it's just 
there's a lot of obstacles in the way still to make this move as fast as uh, it should. Uh, another one where uh, another mechanism is in place now, or starting to get in place, is Lancaster Sound. Lancaster Sound there was one of the first places where there was sea use planning in Canada, and at that time, that was in the 1980s, people were kind of looking at it as a bit of a curiosity. Now this is an, a very important part of the uh, Northwest Passage that will become one of the areas used uh, for shipping eventually. There's a large part of that is now proposed as a national <coughs> marine uh, conservation area. And, and uh, this will be very interesting to see what this will actually mean in reality. Now I want to point out the, the uh, national marine conservation area because we actually have legislation saying that all the representative areas in Canada, there's 26 or 27 of them, something like that, each of those kinds of habitats should have representative areas where you could actually pinpoint um, and say, aha, this, is, this area is protected within that and it will tell us about the area. It could be of use for fisheries management and so forth, uh, helping to replenish uh, stocks. Uh, we're far from there. Uh, just to highlight again what uh, uh, Jordan was saying, uh, look at the small percentage of protected areas in the oceans in Canada compared to the land areas. And most people would say in the land areas it's not enough. So um, I don't look at the detail of this, but this shows all these different types of areas. You know, uh, you can look at um, Hudson Bay, for example, or the uh, north and south part of, uh, of the uh, west coast, Pacific coast. There's a lot of areas, but particularly in the Arctic, um, we, we need a lot more effort. And uh, one of the things that uh, CPAWS, which has been a prime uh, contributor to this, they have a whole list of things <coughs> that they feel are urgent priorities for marine protected areas, and they're not all being acted on at this point in time. So we do have a document, and talk, 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 talk is very cheap, called the National Network of MPAs. Do we have a national network of MPAs in Canada? Uh, well, here's one point of view from a person who I respect a lot. Uh, through the Pew Foundation, Daniel Pauly uh, from the UBC Fisheries Centre, who's one of the people that really understands the oceans and fisheries very well in Canada and around the world. And uh, he's been running something, um, a database called MPA Global, looking at marine protected areas all around the world. And if you go and look at the Canadian entries, there's 574 of them, including provincial coastal parks and ecological reserves and so forth. I can go out in my kayak and go right around the ecological reserves uh, two kilometers offshore from where I live uh, for birds, for example. Marine parks in British Columbia, there's dozens of them. Uh, but they're mainly for, they've been chosen not for their ecological value, although sometimes there is ecological value, but it's nice, safe shelters for uh, boats that go up and down the coast, you know, small pleasure boats or big pleasure boats. So um, this is a kind of overstates the case, but it's not Daniel Pollock's fault. This is following certain criteria. Um, we're starting to see this now emerge um, as networks within the regions. So for example, um, there's whale sanctuaries, coral sanctuaries, uh, and a place called the Gully, where a lot of the uh, really interesting whales uh, that are offshore from Nova Scotia collect. Now, and then there's a lot of actually land-based ones, which are primarily for birds and protection of wetlands. <coughs> the, the problem with this is, can you really call it a network? What are the criteria? What, how will it relate? How will all of this relate uh, that I've got on this uh, diagram? How will it relate to sustainable fisheries management? Because that's the kind of question that we should be asking. I don't think we're asking that question very well in Canada now, but I would urge Finn to be thinking about that when you're thinking about um, sustainability of seafood and so forth. How does it relate back to the other things in the ocean ecosystem? And how can we use those tools better? Uh, Pensima, uh, this diagram uh, shows the, all these different um, uh, places that I mentioned, the corals and other areas that deserve some sort of um, um, protection of one sort or another from here and now, um, management issues, things like the trawlers and, and uh, other activities, oil and gas in some cases. Now, here is the makings of at least a west coast, northwest coast um, network. Here's what I'd like to see. Uh, if you look at Pinsim, and I've taken it out to the 200 mile zone because I feel we should be going out to the 200 mile zone on this. But if you had, uh, I call it Bowie to Brooks, 
The Brooks Peninsula is a, a really, I should have put a picture of it in, it's so interesting to see it from the air. And I, it's it's a, a finger of land that goes out to the sea. It's an interesting place because um, during the Second World War, when we were patrolling all along the coast for uh, ships coming across from Asia, um, a lot of ship, a lot of airplanes were lost in the Bowie, uh, in the uh, uh, Brooks Peninsula, because right at that point there's a change in the currents, and you get all so there's a north and a south current coming, and they change seasonally, and right at that point you can get. I, I talked to a pilot about this when I was flying over it with him, and he was saying that he had actually seen what looked like Niagara Falls coming up because the currents are clashing. You get this water coming up, rising out of the ocean. And, and uh, he said it was just like this wall of water coming up and then crashing down the other side in the atmosphere. So these are the things that only pilots see, I guess, but he said an exceedingly dangerous area. But it's, it's uh, again, a very important area separating the north and the south and the kinds of animal migrations, whales and so forth, and seabirds. And then if you look at the top end, there's the Bowie Seamount. And, and there's seamounts, these mountains that rise up almost to the ocean, top of the ocean. Um, but in the case of Boise Mount, it comes within 75 feet of the surface. Now I have talked to people that have gone out there and their sailboats, big sailboats, and scuba dived on that seamount. It's filled with life. It's absolutely filled with life. And, and so we have a whole series of these. This is the only one that currently gets any protection whatsoever from fishing, as far as I can tell. And there's other things in the Scott Islands and um, Rarity is very important. Ulican uh, estuaries, another one of these strange little fish, uh, things I won't go into, the sponge reefs and so forth. So this is not just a big bland uh, body of light blue or anything like that. When you start looking at what's on the bottom, it needs protection. The sea otters coming back, um, and, and they're part of the ecosystem now. Uh, some First Nations hate them because they're taking oysters, they're taking all sorts of creatures that they want to harvest. Uh, the uh, coral reefs I've mentioned. Guayhanas, uh, which is land co-managed between Parks Canada and now a marine conservation under area under the Marine Conservation Act and the Haida people. One of the most innovative systems of co-management anywhere in the world. I mean, this is fabulous. And this is going to mean a whole different approach towards fisheries management in the area, <coughs> towards uh, how the Haida people perceive their responsibilities, and how the government of Canada, and the province of Canada actually, uh, it's all done on a co-management basis. This is one of the most exciting things that you can possibly imagine. And this is what the southern end, you can see down that yellow tip, the southern end, which happens to be where the highest recorded winds were ever uh, recorded. And it was off a uh, test oil rig there in the 1970s, I think it was. Uh, 200 kilometers an hour or something like that. So this is the kind of uh, habitat that's up there. And you can see the animals that are living there, uh, the sea lions, the beautiful area. Um, oops. Sea mount. Um, above that, rockfish. Those fish. Many of them are 70 years old, and as some of my colleagues who want to protect them say, would you eat your grandparents? Uh, because they're delicious, uh, they're served on many menus, and uh, uh, not very sustainably uh, harvested. And in fact, before Bowie Seamount, while well, it was still under consideration, that's just a, a, a plot of uh, the depth contours and, and uh, these currents that circulate around on the Bowie Seamount, but fishermen were being told to go out there and fish while they still could. So even in the, this is say seven or eight years ago when, when it was actively known that Bowie Sea <coughs> was going to be uh, handled, there was boats going out there. So now that problem is solved, but there's all these other problems along the coast. Should you allow boats to go out to other seamounts? Triangle Island, uh, a most amazing place. Uh, the day I went out there, the pilot said, you were lucky. You get one to two days a year when it looks like this and it's not covered in rain and fog. You can see the little blip on the top of it. That was a, a lighthouse. They put the lighthouse up in the, uh, in the cloud level so no, the lighthouse keepers could never see it. 
the weather was so bad there that lighthouse keepers uh, often would get no food for two or three months at a time. Um, sadly, some of the lighthouse keepers went crazy out there as well. And, and there's only the base of the lighthouse uh, left. A hurricane blew the uh, lighthouse itself away. Um, and sadly also, one of the leading scientists that studied, it's a great place, one of the great nesting areas for certain um, uh, important seabirds. And uh, sadly, one of the scientists fell off the cliff and she uh, died. There's a wonderful book, though, that's been written about Triangle Island uh, with a lot of watercolors and so forth uh, by an artist that uh, went out at a later time. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting spot. Now, what do you think those things are? Uh, innovation with ocean technology and sovereignty issues uh, such as signing on to the law of the sea. We never ratified the law of the sea, for example. I think it's time to revisit and strengthen our commitment to the oceans. I think we've made a start with the Oceans Action Plan, but I think it's um, got some good points and it's faltering in some key areas and not enough resources or even attention is being given to it. Uh, ask when the last time this was reviewed in Parliament, for example. Uh, the fisheries, as far as I can see, the committee that deals with fisheries um, uh, and oceans matters in the uh, current parliament is pretty much dysfunctional. Certainly not dealing with the kinds of questions that we're talking about here tonight. It will probably receive the uh, report of the um, Commissioner on Environment and Sustainable Development and MPAs, say thank you. We probably won't be needing any serious discussion of this, long-term discussion of this. Thank you very much for your hard work. And that's what things have degraded to at various times now. We need much more than that. Uh, so in the work of Finn and with, I hope, your other colleagues around the country, that you will join the voices of those who do speak, I think, responsibly and sensibly uh, about, the, and for the, about and for the oceans, but that you will take these kinds of broader perspectives and keep those in mind even as you focus very strongly on the need for uh, going after the individual species and looking at the problems related to all of the fish that are out in the ocean uh, because it's clear we're going to be eating more varieties of them and we're going to find some of them very scarce still in the future. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. And, and so we've had your attention for a long time tonight and uh, but so, but you're welcome to ask some questions if you'd like to do that. I, if you ask a question, then I'll repeat it because then we can capture it on video. And, and but we'd be more than pleased to take questions. So, um, if anyone has one, then uh, yeah, just to the general problem of sustainability. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Donald Wright's idea of a progress drought. So, like our ancestors um, killing. <clears throat> Two mammoths, let's say, over one is a good idea, that's progress. But once they could drive 200 off a cliff and kill an entire herd and then like kill more herds until they all, our ancestors in those areas would starve to death because they'd kill all the mammoths, essentially, um, that would be a progress trap, quote unquote, from Donald Trump. And I was wondering um, if you guys have any thoughts about if that applies, if that's like an oversimplistic generalization, or if it fits, if there's anything we could do about it. So the question is whether the idea of progress trap is relevant to this issue. And a progress trap is the expansion of technology to harvest beyond sustainable limits, I guess. Do you want to take that? Sure, sure. Uh, um, well, it, it's part of a larger problem of traps. Um, and, and progress traps is certainly one. And we get caught in those traps because something works well for us for a time period. And certainly that was true in the fisheries case. And then when it doesn't work well, we're still uh, adhering to that approach. So one of the things, and this is one of the reasons why I bring out the ecosystem work and so forth, we, we have to open our mind to alternative possibilities. And also there's another little phrase that's used called option <coughs> foreclosure. Um, it, you know, for example, if you lay out all the different uses in the ocean um, and everybody's scrambling for space in the ocean, you know, the fishermen don't want aquaculture because they can't park their boats or their nets are in the way, whatever it happens to be. The oil people want one thing, the aquaculturists don't want the oil people, etc. So you've got to have some rational uh, case for making choices. 
But option foreclosure, if you do it well, and zoning is one of the ways to do that, um, allows for more to go on, but at a lower risk. And what we're doing now, I think, is moving back towards a sectoral approach, where it happens right now uh, that the sector happens to be oil and gas. It could equally be some other sector in the future. Uh, could be deep ocean mining, for example, or shallow ocean mining. Um, and, and so we have to have a ra more rational basis than just following whatever we think at the moment is the best, you know? And, and uh, so that's, that's we're really dealing with the progress trap. Um, I think there's also, a kind, and maybe it accompanies it, but a kind of a conceptual trap sometimes as well. You know, we, we adhere to ideas and therefore won't open our minds up. But then something comes along. Uh, it could be some terrible accident. Uh, the classic case is the Exxon Valdez or something like that. And suddenly, bang, you're in a whole new uh, environment of thinking. And you're not prepared for it. You don't have solutions. You don't have, haven't thought your way through the kind of knowledge bases you need. And, and so that's another kind of trap that we have to face. Because that's why I say, think about accidents. Many of the changes in our society are the result of accidents. And something so awful happens that we have to think of a new way of doing things. And so a lot of what I think uh, the scientific community is dealing with in the oceans right now is to say we've got to prepare ourselves for a future that's very uncertain. And therefore, we need to have a lot of knowledge. And we have to ask a lot of what ifs so that we are prepared to make um, direction shifts as necessary in the future, whether they're from climate change or some horrible accident or just changing priorities in society. One of those priorities, for sure, is that uh, all those certification programs are going to become the way we do business. And those people who are not engaged in that in the fisheries are going to learn the hard way. That's my prediction for five to ten years. Uh, what would be the negative consequences with zoning, um, especially economic consequences, the loss of jobs or closing of industries? Um, what would some of those be? The question is the negative, potential negative consequences of zoning. Um, yeah, it's a good question, really good question. Um, well, to start with, it is, if you impose zoning, it's almost certainly going to have a lot of negative consequences. One of which is people simply won't accept it, and therefore illegal activities will take place. Uh, so the first thing about zoning is it's got to be done on a consultative and collegial, and some and collegial is the wrong word, collaborative way, in bringing stakeholders together. That's essential. Otherwise, there's all sorts of ways around zoning. Uh, the second thing about zoning is um, if there are economic trade-offs, one has to look at that um, carefully because there may be ways to avoid them. And if you don't look at the economics carefully, then you can do really dumb things with economic zoning. The third thing is, if you're going to make an assertion like we have both made tonight, that we think MPAs, which is a type of zoning, can be helpful in the overall issue of fisheries management, eventually, maybe we can get away with saying that for a number of years, maybe even decades, eventually we've got to show the results. So there needs to be a lot of monitoring and so forth as well. Otherwise, uh, it's your word against my word, so to speak. You know? And so, so those are some of the uh, consequences. On the positive side, if you do things right with zoning, you can actually get added value. You can have, uh, well, give you an example. There was a full page ad in the uh, paper uh, in, in uh, uh, British Columbia, I think it's probably in a number of the papers, by a group of people in, engaged in marine tourism on um, the Discovery uh, Sound area, which is up the coast a little ways. And the point was, in this case, that they, they feared a bunch of clear-cutting that was going to totally destroy, or largely destroy, the potential for tourism. So um, you zone that, you don't let that happen, uh, or do you just let it happen? Well, they've got the rights to uh, clear-cutting, um, and the, the people are saying, well, we're going to lose our livelihoods. People aren't going to want to come up and see clear cuts. Uh, so those are things that if you do get together, you, there's probably a good solution. And everybody gives at the end of the day, but there's probably a solution. It's the same as that example between that I gave of the whales going and avoiding the ship collisions. For years, there was resistance again. Uh, the, you know, they said there's going to be ships crashing into each other and all sorts of things, or it won't work. Work perfectly. 
So, so, and that was a zoning one. So, so look for the positive side of it and anticipate if there are negative things, can they be addressed? Yeah, just from the point of view of an organization like Finn, I think uh, I read that the IUUs um, also engage in a lot of odious behaviors that aren't necessarily related to what you talked about tonight, i.e., you know, human trafficking, yeah. drugs, now yeah. that sort of thing. And I'm just wondering, in order to help uh, give the issue more political prominence, is there? Do you see linkages possible, or possibly between this issue and others that people, that other groups or other people may, you know, sort of consider to be sort of trigger ideas? If you understand the question. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the question are. is, given that there are illegal fishing activities and that those illegal activities spill in, into other domains of illegality, like perhaps drug trafficking and human trafficking, are there ways of making political capital out of those connections? Um, and it, it's interesting that the IUU, and I think that's relatively new that people have been trying to make those linkages, even though we've known that there are linkages. Um, I, th I think uh, the answer, a quick answer is yes, but it has to be done very carefully. Um, and it has to be done on the, it has to be evidence-based, and it has to be done not just at a kind of a global thinking level, or it won't lead anywhere. It has to be got down to uh, very serious things. To give you one example, um, in the 1980s, um, the fisheries industry in the south of Thailand really went into decline, and it was fish stocks that had been overfishing, and all they could catch were jellyfish and squid. Um, so, and there's thousands of boats. So many of them turned into predatory action against uh, Vietnamese ref refugees coming out of Vietnam. And, and it was a terrible situation, really awful. Um, well, one of the things that happened um, was that uh, Thailand, which was very concerned, and the rest of the world was as well, but Thailand decided that they would take on the function of turning the, this past industry into a processing industry for the world's tuna and successfully managed to build a whole new industrial basis around taking frozen tuna from everywhere in the world. So if you look at all your canned tuna, if you happen to eat tuna, or that, you'll find most of it's been uh, canned in, in Thailand ever since. So it, it created a new industry uh, that at least picked up some of the jobs and got out of a lot of the illegal other activities, and, and including a lot of the illegal fisheries activities, because the Thais were also going off into Indonesian waters and elsewhere, and just savaging uh, the fish stocks there and shrimp stocks and so forth. So there, there can be solutions to that. I, I think the on this IUU thing, it's a huge issue. FAO has been very useful on it, um, and a lot of countries are now buying in very. Uh, in a very good way, including many developing nations. I think we're making progress on it, but there's a long way to go still. And so anything that can link it to the other illegal activities, some of which are very odious to countries, um, that would be helpful. Do you think that um, aggressive activism like uh, Sea Shepherd can be positive, or do you think that that's counterproductive? The question is whether aggressive action like that of the Sea Shepherd can be productive or whether overall that's counterproductive. Well, I have a personal view on this. Um, my personal view, which is, uh, I think, uh, agreed upon by at least some of my colleagues, not everybody, is that we need a number of different... It is a war that's being fought. And, and Sea Shepherd is, is fighting actively on some fronts where others fear to go. But we need people who are on the fronts, whether it's Greenpeace, whether it's uh, Sea Shepherd, whether it's people who are milder in their actions, but still, uh, for example, um, in the case of Sierra Club, now taking harder stands than they've decided, which might include some actions uh, that are not very nice, but not on the level of uh, going out and ramming ships or whatever that uh, Sea Shepherd has been accused of. Um, I, I think that there's a, a wide spectrum of things are needed some of which are on that far end, and, and I'm not, I don't want people to be injured in the process, but uh, they're making a point in a dramatic way that, that uh, no, others cannot make. Um, then there are the people that, um, um, that go out, and there's lots of them, 
go out and make movies. They go out and uh, do active research with money that's raised for their cause, and then many of the NGOs fall in this. And, and so they're not going that far, but they're still, they're still activists, highly activists. And they're going out and they're looking at the problems locally and internationally and so forth, and, and they're valuable. There's people like myself that have chosen to work closer to government, but I mean, I, I'd like to believe that I understand some things about science, and I want to see that translated into public policy. If I ever um, went out and did something like Sea Shepherd, I, I certainly wouldn't be welcome in some of the circles that I travel in with, with government people or whatever. So you make choices. And then there are scientists that often um, want to remain very close to their science, uh, whatever it happens to be, and would prefer to bring that information freely and well out to the public and so forth, but not be the frontliners themselves. And, and, so, and, and then there's others as well. Um, I also believe in the power of one. You know, individuals like the school teacher in the Wales in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, that was just a, an ordinary school teacher in a small rural school district uh, who did something that was really very, very valuable at the time. And, and we can find many other examples. I could tell you dozens of stories. There's people, um, there's a, an organization that deals with fisheries management um, on a collective sort of basis in the west coast of Vancouver Island. And they stick their necks out. They, they work collectively between First Nations um, and uh, with governments, federal, provincial, they're supported from a variety of different sources. And they manage a lot of species that are not the big flashy salmon or so forth, but other things. And they're making progress in setting the basis for a new form of fisheries management. And, and it's tough, let me tell you how tough it is, because I've, I've looked at this organization quite closely. Uh, and and uh, so we need people that are activists in different ways. Uh, we need people that are educators, we need researchers, a whole range. So I, I do think, uh, I must admit that I have a higher degree of uh, respect for Paul Watson than uh, many people might have. I, I think he's, he's shown us, he's shone a lot of light into some very, very dark corners. Okay, um, okay so I kind of have this lead up on the same question. I'm interested in how we can introduce this or how can I extract something on the more like the daily interaction that we have, you know, like choosing a better f label yeah. or, uh, you know, are there any maybe way of like, because with food on land, like, you know, quality is an important aspect. So you can, I guess you could take an individual to a farm, <laughs> show them the process of what a food yeah. choice is. Yeah. But how do you show something as this? I mean, we don't have the same connection with the fish as we do sure. animals. So is there another way of educating uh, more generally the public? Why don't you take the, the first uh, try? You know, you're you're a person who deals with behavioral psychology mm -hmm. sorts of things. I think, uh, which this is all about psychology and behavior. And well, the do. the question is and consumerism. What can be, you know? What can be done to link these issues to behavior at a at a local level? Um, you know, it's that's something. That's just maybe if there's like a, a project that you have or that already is circulating that maybe we can point people. Oh, uh, yeah. Even okay. like, because this is an intellectual talk, I would say, and I can't really sure. uh, voice this information across uh, adequately. So maybe if I can point an individual to it. Well, I, I th the, only, the only real effective means of changing individual behavior that I think would actually work um, is for people to write their MPs and the members of the cabinet. Because believe it or not, politicians actually pay attention to letters. And so a lot of what we've talked about tonight, especially the marine protected areas issue, isn't going to be moved forward unless the politicians sense that there's actual public demand. Like the framework's already there, right? They've signed the treaties and so on. But the way they're reading the population is it's perfectly okay to ignore that. And the only way to change that, as far as I can tell, is to indicate that it's actually not okay to ignore it. Because right now it is okay. And, and that's not good. Our political system actually does work. It's much more permeable than people really think because in some ways it's left to its own devices. You know, most people don't really participate in the political system. So it leaves it in the hands of the very small minority who do. But it's surprisingly permeable if you're interested in permeating it. And 
So, well, that's that's my take, at least at the political level. Yeah, that, that's one. Um, let, let me give you four or five things that I think are really uh, useful. Uh, one is, uh, if you have the trust in them, uh, these seafood guides are very helpful. And so you can use those in your own personal life. And if you go into a restaurant, uh, ask them, has this, and, and if you happen to enjoy fish, ask them, uh, tell me about this fish. What is the species? Where was it captured from? Um, what, is it certified fish that you're serving? Ask the chef to come out and talk to you. I've done that. And, and, and go in, if you use an iPad or a, 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 an iPhone, and challenge them on some things when they say they don't know, they, there's no information. And then I did this once in, in a very respectable restaurant in Vancouver, and I warned them, I said, look, I'm bringing a group of people who are leaders in this whole seafood process. They're going to have all sorts of questions. So I brought my iPad, it was brand new in those days, it had just come out six months before, and, and we sat down and half an hour, of, oh, by the time the, the poor chefs were sweating, let me tell you, but they answered all the questions correctly. We got all the information and we got past all these fancy names and so forth. So that's another way in dealing with the food industry. Do it at a supermarket. If you're not getting good answers, write to the president of the company and say, you know, I was in whatever chain it happened to be, local or national, and, and I could not get any answer about whether the crab that you're serving was sustainably produced. Can you tell me? And if they can't, go after them and say, please, I really want an, an honest answer. But I'll bet you'll get an answer, and, and you'll make your decisions. And a, a third way is, as you say, go to the politicians and keep going to the politicians. Find out who the politicians locally are that really have an interest in the subject, because there are little clusters of people that don't get very much support in both the Senate and in the House that really are interested, and they cross party lines in some of these things as well. Um, and, and that's another way of doing it. But go to, I, I think that on sustainable development in general, we have to go to the cities. And I won't say anything about Toronto and the <laughs> political system right now, how much this would come up to the top, but. I know certainly on the West Coast, and I think in a lot of places in the East Coast, it's, it's very central. People will talk about it to you. And they are the places where action is taking, uh, taking on interesting uh, approaches. Uh, the next one is to figure out, and, and you can only do this yourself by looking at different organizations. Decide which organizations you're going to support. And support them in ways, not just maybe giving them some money from time to time, but ask how you can help. Because uh, just to give you a couple examples, World Wildlife Fund, uh, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, both have excellent, <coughs> excellent people that need support. You know, not just money, but they need people behind them in various ways. And, and there's various things there. Uh, and I guess finally, uh, if you have children, will have children, or whatever, work with kids. Kids genuinely want to do things better. They understand kids. You know, you're cute animals. Well, I was a bit insulted about that fish that you chose, you know. <laughs> but I thought it was kind of cute myself. <laughs> but but, but uh, uh, the important point is that uh, kids love whales. Our, our little granddaughter, who's eight years old, she proudly announces, oh, I'm uh, doing a research project on uh, Pacific dolphin. And, and by the time she finished that thing, she knew a lot about Pacific dolphins. Help people that way, you know? you know. Get at young people, young people who really want to, because they, they are upset by these things. They see it. There's a lot of stuff on television and so forth, the internet. They, they're getting done that there's a problem, and, and they happen to love these things. They love dolphins, they love seals, and they, this, that, and the other, and certainly whales. And, and uh, they can't understand why they, these things are in trouble, or the fish that they might eat are in trouble. So those are some concrete ways that you can actually address this. And keep that, that list in mind as you move ahead with Finn as well, because I think it's a really important question. We, I'm talking, and we all are talking that maybe a bit abstractly here, but in each case, you can bring these things down to, uh, to real life. Another one on the West Coast, just to give you, uh, and I'll stop on this, but if you go to any school around Victoria, Greater Victoria, you'll see salmon images. Uh, that the kids have individually made and painted, and, and they're on the school fences. It's in front of them, you know, about sustainable. In, in uh, some uh, communities, uh, spray painting around, sorry, spray painting around uh, gutters and saying, you know, this water leads to a salmon stream. 
You know, so awareness. All right, so I think we've had your attention long enough. Thank you very much for coming. That's uh, much appreciated. And uh, thanks to Dr. Hansen. Thank you as well.